Now, Huzz and Buzz, what did I tell you about that? <laughs> Behave yourselves. <laughs> Huzz and Buzz. There's two brothers. All right, chapter 22 of uh, Genesis. And uh, we start right off in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And uh, we just have to talk about that a little bit. Uh, this chapter is a hard chapter. Not hard because it's hard to understand what's going on, but hard because of what is going on or what God asks Abraham to do. And we have to address this issue of being tested by God. That's what it says here. And it doesn't just say this in the Old Testament. If we look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, it says the same thing and affirms the fact that, that in fact, God was testing Abraham. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. So, um, God is the one who's initiating this test of Abraham. And uh, that in itself is, is kind of difficult for us, because when we consider it testing, we're considering that it's going to be something hard, something unpleasant, something that we don't want to go through. That's what this word test kind of involves. And um, for Abraham, clearly, this is the case. Now, it's not just Abraham that God tests. We see that God tests others. He tested Moses and the people of Israel uh, when they were going through the wilderness. It says in Exodus 15:25. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them, it said. So God's testing them there, the people of Israel and Moses. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And then in Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Now, we uh, have to ask the question, well, why does God test us? Why does God test his people? And uh, we actually, in that last verse that I read, Exodus 20, 20, we kind of get a clue as to one of the reasons that God might test us. It says, so that we may not sin. And so the testing works in our lives in such a way so that it averts the sinfulness from our lives. Um, uh, testing will also uh, come to us in order to basically demonstrate or, or um, uh, to show, uh, to, make, to make a show of what is inside of us, the, the truth that's inside of us, the authenticity, our authenticity. In other words, so God might do that and then in order to bring forth greater things. So that's why you'll hear me say from time to time, we go through hard things and then uh, we move on to bigger and better things. You ever heard me say that? Well, I wish I had never said that, but uh, you know, that, that's kind of how it, it moves. We move on to greater things. And um, you know, the, the demonstration of God's uh, glory and his grace in our lives is seen by how we handle the tests that come our way. And, you know, I wish we could say that we're always passing the tests and we always do very well and pass with flying colors, but it doesn't always go like that. And the test isn't a test unless it's truly difficult. And we see even Jesus in the garden, um, the test, if you will, that was before him, or the act of obedience of going all the way to the cross, was uh, something that, you know, when he prayed to the Father, if it's your will... Take this cup from me. Remember that? And it says he resisted to the point of blood in the Gospel of Luke. So, you know, we can, we can ask the question whether or not it was possible for Jesus to sin. Well, whether or not it was possible, and however we answer that question, it wasn't easy in, in a sense that it, in his humanity he sweat great drops of blood. And um, so anyways, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 it says, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart. There, there's the authenticity, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So the test comes in order to prove us or to show that um, we belong to him. Um, I was reading about Job this, this afternoon, and um, the whole thing 
is about demonstrating who Job is and his, his genuine relationship that he had with God. You remember how Satan comes to him twice in the first two chapters there? And, and uh, God says, have you noticed my servant Job? And, and the devil says, no wonder he serves you because you bless him so much. And, and God allowed him to uh, touch Job in his life and the, you know, the people and the things in his life in order to, it was part of the demonstration that Job was, in fact, his person, and that he was genuine in his faith. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you. There's the same thing. Except the, the second part of the verse is a little bit different. This is uh, chapter Deuteronomy 8, 16. I just read Deuteronomy 8, 2. To humble you and to test you, that's 8. Deuteronomy 8, 2. To humble you and to test you, to know what is in your heart. Deuteronomy 8, 16. That he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. So there within a few verses we, we see God saying it twice. The first one was to know what is in their heart. The second one to do them even better in the end. That the blessing they, they might receive would be greater in the end. And so the thought of a loving and caring God who we go to and we cry out to when we're having hard times. The idea that he would test us is not a pleasant prospect because every test that we go through seems hard and none of us wants to go through a hard time. And um, our view of God is that his purpose is to give us a life that is smooth, that, that's just smooth. That, that's kind of how we think or conceive in our minds that it should be. That my life is, ought to be, because I'm a Christian, it ought to be smooth sailing all the way through. And anything else just seems unkind and unloving. And so that's, that's, um, that's kind of our perception or, I, our, I, or our idea. Because our view of things is fixed on ourselves. And we, it is very difficult for us to look beyond ourselves to the, to the greater picture and uh, to the glory of God. It's difficult for us to look beyond that. But... Um, Anyway, that, that's kind of the case here. And, and then we have James. <clears throat> and James, we have a little wrench thrown into this whole idea of God testing us because of what it says here. It says in chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So far, so good. I mean, the word temptation there is the same word testing in the New Testament. And so we can see that we are blessed when we are tested, for when we have been approved, that means when, when it has been shown what we are like, then we will see the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. But then you have this in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now, according to this passage, it seems like God doesn't test us, but we have to, even though the word test and tempt is the same, we, we have to understand that there are, there, are, there are two ways that this might play out. And what James is talking about is when we are tempted or tested towards doing something evil or sinful. And that's why the word tempt is translated tempt in the, these verses in James, because it is our lusts, our desires, which draw us and entice us towards doing things that are sinful. And so it's a temptation. Whereas when God tests us, he does not provoke us or try to entice us to sinfulness. That is not what God does. God never does that. So if there is any test, it is not to see if we will fail and sin. That would be evil. Um, instead... Uh, it, is, it is the test to prove what the worth of you. So if I'm going to school and I'm taking a class and I take a test, it is not to try to fail me, although you never know what some of the motives of some of the teachers are, but the idea is to bring out what I know and to see if I have mastered the material. And in that sense, it is a good thing. And so if I'm going to play out on the soccer field and, and I'm you know, being pushed and pushed, being tested you know, over and over and over again, again, it's not to make me fail, but it is to strengthen me and to make me you know, use those muscles and to, to, uh, 
uh, expand my my uh, you know my breathing so that I can endure you know running out there for th those lengths of time. And so the end result is a good thing, and we we willingly and happily submit ourselves to those kinds of tests in order to broaden and strengthen and expand who we are in our relationship to the Lord. If I'm if I have a job at a business and and maybe I'm being considered for a promotion, I might uh, be given a a special task by my boss in order to see if I'm capable, if I if I am if I have what it takes to handle the new position. And so I might be tested in that sense, or I might be put in the situation, or I might be given an extra responsibility just to see how I'm going to respond, to see whether or not I have what it takes to be promoted or to go to the to the next level. And so the idea of testing isn't always negative. I mean, it feels negative to us because it's a hard time in our lives and we're being stretched and we're being expanded. But it's not necessarily, and definitely when God is the initiator of it, it is not to bring me to sinfulness like the devil might do or like the, what, what my flesh might lead me to. And then another thing that we have to consider in all of this is that uh, the te te temptations or the testings that come against us are not more than we can handle. And there's a promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, and notice God's role in all of this. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so that's, uh, that's the, uh, God showing his grace in the temp temptation, that he restrains it from happening uh, to, to a certain point so that we might not be overwhelmed or overcome by it. Um, and so that's important to consider as well. And then, uh, uh, some, like, like I mentioned a moment ago, some things are more valuable to God than my comfort, my immediate comfort. And so we see this again in James coming out. A few, this is right at the beginning of James chapter 1, the first few verses there. The beginning of verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so we see here that the testing of our faith is a good thing, and it produces some things that are valuable in the sight of God. Our faith is valuable in the sight of God. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, we look at the temptations or the struggles that we're going through here, and uh, uh, we are pained by them, and we don't understand them always, but uh, uh, our focus has to go beyond just that circumstance to bigger and better things. And uh, things like faith and uh, patience and the perfection of, of who we are spiritually and uh, the completion of who we are. These are all important things to God that my, my relationship to Him is better in the end. That is important to Him. That I'm closer to Him. That is important to Him. Because... If we don't have these things in our lives, if we don't have to call in on the Lord, then we'll just go around like little children all of our lives until the day we die, and then we, you know, just barely make it into heaven and, and uh, not have it ever experienced uh, a closer walk with Him. And then uh, one of the things that I had said before, that we move on to greater things, uh, there's another way to look at that, because, uh, you know, every great thing that God does in the Bible arises out of a great trial or, tr or, or, or trouble. Uh, you know, we want to see the miracle, right? We want to see God do great things. But the miracle and the great things always arise out of some trouble that a person needs deliverance from. So you have the people of Israel, they are enslaved, and they're enslaved for 400 years. And uh, because this trial is so great, uh, when the time comes for them to be delivered, the deliverance is great. Because of the great trouble they are in. And uh, it's sort of like when Jesus says, He who is forgiven little loves little, but he who is forgiven lot loves a lot. It's sort of along those same lines. So there's a greater thing that God wants to produce in our lives that goes beyond just our, our pleasure and our comfort with the things of this life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, the same idea comes out. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. 
that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, and you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. There, there, there is so much in that passage right there that has to do with our various trials and, and our faith and... and um, praise and honor and glory and love and there is so many things in that passage there and all of those things are greater than uh, the, the little trials that we are going through and I say little in light of the big you know the big picture here and uh, it's not pleasant but uh, this is this is the truth of it and I'll tell you what, and I've been mentioning lately some of you who have been going through hard times, and, and, I, and if, I do, if I keep on doing it, I'm going to keep on doing it. Because I'll tell you what, not everybody who has come to this church who has experienced trials has gone through them successfully. They have fallen away because of them. And it, and it, and it's, and it grieves my heart, but I could, I could name them just as much as I could name some of you who have gone through the hard times and you're still... You're still going forward, and you're going forward strong. So uh, that's why I've been mentioning it, and the Lord's just really impressing this upon uh, my heart recently. And so we need to pray for some of these others who have fallen away because of the trials and tem the temptations that they're falling through. Because it's not a given, it's not a guarantee that we're going to come through them successfully. So if you're coming through them successfully, then praise be to God that He is at work in your life, and the faith has been. Um, shown to be uh, strong and, and fixed upon him. So anyway, God tested Abraham. And we see in verse 2, Genesis 22, verse 2, that, that Abraham loved him. This was his son. He loved him. And this is kind of the basis for his, uh, uh, the, the trial and the temptation that Abraham has to go through. It calls him his only son. This was true even in the Hebrews passage that I read. And, uh, and here we have to, we have to um, back up a little bit. Because Abraham did have another son, Ishmael. And so what we see, we take a step back here, and, and God calls Isaac his only son. And uh, this must have stung Abraham a little bit, because we know that Abraham loved that Ishmael also. And it was hard for him, especially the second time. Uh, it says a little bit more than the first time. The first time when uh, they sent them away, uh, Abraham, it says, just hearkened unto the voice of his wife and sent them out. But the second time, it was harder. Uh, there, was a, there was some grief there. And uh, so we know that Abraham loved Ishmael. And when God said to take your only son, it, it shows that there was truly, when they sent them out, the second time, last time when we read in chapter 21, there was truly a disconnect that, that took place. That Ishmael was not the child of promise, and they would not, he would not receive the inheritance because it was greater than just Abraham's possession. So anyway, uh, Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, uh, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, this is the verse I read before, offered up Isaac, uh, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So uh, it, it says that more than one time. Now, uh, we, we look at Abraham and we say, how, how in the world, how did he handle this? How, how did he manage the idea of giving up his own son? And, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, that's a question that'd be, that'd be hard for anybody to have to go through. But uh, there, there's something even greater at stake here than Abraham just losing his son, as hard as that might be. Isaac, Isaac just wasn't, wasn't just his son. Isaac was the son of God's promise. So what's bigger at stake here is the integrity of God. The, God had made a promise concerning Isaac. And the integrity of who God is is at stake at this point here. Uh, God had promised to give him a son, Abraham, to give him a son. God had promised to multiply his descendants and to make them how many? More than where the sand of the sea. That's right, like the sand of the sea, like the stars of the heavens. He had promised to multiply his descendants in that way. And not only is that at stake, but then you also have the promise that through his seed would come the Messiah. And so, if Isaac is cut off, then the Messiah is cut off. 
because that's what God had promised. So this is huge. Our redemption is at stake in this passage here. Uh, so it goes way beyond just the sacrifice of his son. It, it goes to what God had promised to do throughout the course of history and uh, in, including the redemption that is found in Christ, which impacts us. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because the New Testament says that we are the sons of Abraham, doesn't it? And it says that a couple of times. And so, you know, it, it's kind of, it all is tied together. And as far removed as we are from Abraham, we are linked in this way. And this chapter here uh, is, uh, is linked to us because it comes to us through Jesus Christ and uh, the true um, relationship that we have with God through his son, Jesus Christ. So, we read through this passage, and it's really interesting. One of the, one of the things that might stand out to you, uh, or there, there's a couple of things, is that uh, Abraham is really exhibiting faith in this. He does not complain. There is not a single complaint on the part of Abraham. It's almost as if he robotically does what God had commanded him to do, right? God says to do this. We see no passion. We see no complaint. We see no struggle. We see no agony, no spending the night in prayer to God. He rises up early, verses 3 through 4. He makes his preparation. He takes a few servants, and he goes. And then, uh, now, now, we see that he is having faith in this. It, he's not just shut himself off emotionally. He, he hasn't just, well, you know, God said it, and just kind of shut down and, uh, you know, pushed it aside or buried it deep inside of him and, and, and he's going to go through with it. He's not doing that. He's, he's actually having faith. He's uh, putting his faith and his trust in God. And this is where this really becomes powerful. Notice in verse 5, Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, we will come back to you. So there's a, there's a statement of faith of how he believes this is going to resolve itself. And then, what's that? It's perfect faith. Yeah, he's, he's having amazing faith here. In verse 8, Isaac is asking him, Father, you know, where, where is the burnt offering? And God says in verse 8, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And then uh, we really see Abraham's faith as expressed in Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, I'm going to read verse 17 again. I'll go all the way to 19 this time. And uh, you might just want to make note of this. This is Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Now look at verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. That's pretty amazing. Abraham had concluded by faith that if he went through with this, that God would raise up Isaac from the dead. That's, that's amazing. He had never, no, there's, there had been no experience of this before. Uh, God just knew, I mean, Abraham just knew that God had made a promise to him and that he was going to keep his promise no matter what. That's, that's the faith that Abraham had. And so he becomes an example to us of really trusting God no matter what. Isaac becomes a type or a picture of the coming um, sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Um, I, uh, Isaac was not the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That wasn't Isaac. He was just a type of the true lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So he becomes a type or a picture of that. And um, I think we see here just uh, another, uh, another time of the uh, expression of the gospel found here in this, in this uh, instance with Isaac. Uh, you have this throughout the Old Testament where God is interjecting the gospel because they had to look forward to Christ they didn't, have, you know, they didn't have the blessing of being able to look back at the sacrifice of Christ. They were looking forward to the sacrifice of Christ. And uh, God was, throughout the Old Testament, he's throwing in these things, uh, pointing them forward to Jesus Christ. Uh, God affirms his faith. Verses 11 through 14. 
the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Just kind of make a mental note of this right here. The Lord, Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in, mount, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And then in uh, verses 15 through 18, we see it again, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you and multiply, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of your, their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Um, yeah, this promise, God is reaffirming his promises to Abraham, going all the way back to the initial um, introduction of Abraham and he, in chapter 12. In chapter 12, he made some of these promises to Abraham. He reaffirms them all, plus some here in this passage uh, because of what he had done. And then in James chapter, 20, uh, James chapter 2, verse 21... We see that it's, it says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? So this is going to be the, this is, uh, the second time that it says this concerning uh, Abraham in the New Testament. But uh, his justification comes out as a result of his act of obedience based on the promise of God. Alright, there's so much to say about this. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, if you want to throw in or ask or anything. For me, it's interesting in the book of one Peter. You see the parallels in God with his begotten. I think he's the begotten son. Yeah, just like Christ. Jesus is the begotten son. Yeah. The begotten son is the one God provides. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that um, here Isaac is spared. He, Abraham does not have to offer Isaac in the end. But when it came to God offering his only begotten son, he wasn't. He didn't spare him. But he did offer him as the sacrifice. He did uh, throw all the sins of the world on him. Did uh, bring about the death and the penalty for all that sin upon Christ. So God did not spare his only begotten son, even though he spared I, uh, Abraham's son. Yeah. But, but Abraham understood. Abraham understood that God was going to provide him. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. He understood that. Yeah. He, God said he would trust him. And Abraham demonstrated. Yeah. That's right. All right, anybody else on this part? Do you think you could kill your own children and get away with it back then? No. Well. <laughs> um. I don't know if it was a matter of getting away with anything here. Uh, just the fact of just just to have to do it to begin with. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm getting at. You know, this must have been on his mind. What are they going to do to me if I kill him? What are they going to do to me if I kill him? Yeah, well, you know, they, they, had some, they had some of this going on with some of the pagan nations, and uh, a little bit later it becomes a little more specific, but... Uh, I, I don't know if he was really thinking, what is anybody else going? What is everybody else going to do to me? Now, honestly, if if I did this and it went through, what I'd be thinking is like, I don't care what they do to me, even if they kill me. You know, if I my son is dead now, you know, what what does it matter? You know? But uh, I think the only real concern here is the relationship between God and Abraham and having to sa sacrifice Isaac more than anything else. Alright, anything else? Any others? Uh, one last thing to look at is the, the Mount Moriah, uh, the place that uh, God had told him to go. 
He says, go to the place that I tell you to go, and the mountain that I shall, which I shall tell you. And when they got there, he showed Abraham the place, and they went to Mount Moriah. And that is the place, the land of Moriah initially. But this is the, the place uh, that Abraham is directed to by God. And it's not just any place. And if you look on the map, you're going to see that it's a little bit north towards the top of the Dead Sea there. And uh, Mount Moriah is actually the location of the Temple Mount, where they built the temple later. In the Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So if you go to Israel now, um, the Temple Mount is Mount Moriah. That is the location where Abraham had offered Isaac uh, to the Lord. So it's the same place, it's the same location. We're talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about Mount, the Mount of the Lord in Jerusalem. Um, it's not called Jerusalem yet. So we're, uh, Jerusalem doesn't have the history of some of these other cities, although it's going to become very prominent soon. We're introduced to this one other time because there was somebody else from the same place. Anybody, anybody remember? Who else that we've seen so far was from this same place? The same place. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, from the same place. And so the, the Lord, this is the Lord's place, and, and everything is happening right there. It is very significant. Uh, it's not called Jerusalem yet. Um, Abraham calls it the Lord will provide. And it says, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So this is uh, this is the mount of the Lord. That's Mount Moriah, and it's going to it, it is a significant place from that time, even until this time. So it was called Salem. Salem, yes. It was called Salem when, with respect to Melchizedek. And here it's called Moriah. And then Abraham gives it this other name, and the, the mountain of the Lord, or the Lord will provide. He calls it that. Uh, so it has, it has several names. E even before it's called Jerusalem, uh, when it becomes David's cities called the city of David for a while, and it's, uh, so it's, it's just kind of all uh, you know, playing out or unfolding. Uh, but this is, the, this is the location that we're talking about, Mount Moriah. All right, prayer requests? Some people to pray for. Kevin Campbell has uh, been having some severe neck and back issues, so we want to pray for Kevin Campbell. That's Mary, Mary Campbell's husband. We want to remember the bidders, uh, Dan, Dan Gribble, and uh, the Wilders. I don't know if I do. I think an email was sent out, right? Dan, Dan's biological father passed away this year. We want to remember Cecil, he's having uh, surgery to remove the cancer, cancerous growth from his head on the 24th. So let's remember Cecil. Other prayer requests? Yes. Pray for me. I'm starting my chemo again. Roberta's going back to chemo starting tomorrow. Just remember to pray for her. I'm wanting to start an inter intercessory uh, prayer ministry here at the church. So uh, Tom is working on the first room of the trailer over here, and we're going to make it uh, accessible at any time so you can come over and pray. And uh, we'll bring out the prayer box out again. And what I want us to do is to have a team of people, of course anybody could come at any time, but have a team of people who are committed to pray for the needs of the church. And so we'll... We'll print out some sheets and you know prayer requests and needs, and we'll take the prayer requests from the box, and and we'll we're setting up that room there. You can come to the church at any time, and uh, and pray. So I want to I want to have specific and extended prayer here at the church. So we're going to start that coming up soon. Um, Sophia and Colin, they're going with their church in Wheeling on a mission trip. They're leaving on Saturday. They're going to Haiti. So we want to pray for Sophia and Colin and the others that are going with them in that group. And then Daniel, when are you leaving? leaving? 17th or 18th? The 17th or 18th? 
Dale's going to pack the night before. Oh, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but he can do that. All right, so Daniel also is going on a mission trip to Haiti. And um, this, this, they plan these, Sophia and Daniel plan these trips independent of one another. It turns out they'll be there uh, for a couple of days at the same time. So just, uh, I'll, I doubt they'll see each other because they're, they're going to different parts. But uh, anyway, we have some of our people going to Haiti on a mission trip this month. So let's pray for them. Micah, is your hand raised? Do you have a prayer request? What's up? All right. Keep on, keep on praying for Micah. Any other prayer requests? Pray for Miss Paula Greenfield. Okay, Paula Greenfield. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's lift up these requests unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just uh, thank you for this time that you've given to us. We could pray for one another and pray for the needs that uh, we have. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to uh, pick up the burden of others that are around us, even though we might not feel it or sense it or, or uh, be concerned or compassionate. Help us to put all that aside and to take up one another's burdens and to pray for these needs, to pray for one another. Lord, hear us as we lift these needs up to you and answer our prayers for your glory. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we want to, I want to lift up Cecil. He's getting uh, ready to go to, to surgery on the 24th of this month for a, 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 a little, a little uh, cancer tumor on the top of his head. Lord, we pray that you just touch him with your healing hand, Lord, as they, they prepare for the surgery, Lord, we pray that you just touch each, each one of the, the operating sur uh, doctors and the nurses and whoever else is in, in, involved with this operation, Lord, just give them the, the, the knowledge and the, the know-how to, to, to properly take care of this, and Lord, we pray that Cecil can, can come home with that free from cancer, and Lord, you, you just bless him in every, every way possible. Lord, we pray for now my wife, Roberta, she goes tomorrow morning to to hook up with the, the chemo treatment again. Lord, we pray that you just touch her with your healing hand. Lord, guide that, that chemo into her body where it's supposed to go and, and di just dissolve the cancer that's within her. Lord, bring her clean. Lord, bring her back to good health again. Lord, we always pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, we also thank you for for, uh, for Sophia and, and Collins going to, to a, a mission trip to Haiti. Lord, we pray that you just be with them as they, as they go, Lord, also with, with Daniel, include him here too. The three of them are going to, to Haiti for a mission trip. Lord, we pray to give them a safe trip there. Lord, we pray they, they make good connections with the people over there. Lord, help them to, to spread the gospel while they're there and, and, and just get to help the, the people and, and bring back some good reports what what's happening over there. Lord, we pray that, that you are there with them and we know you will be. And Lord, just bring them back home safe again. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. One more thing, Lord, we pray for Micah as, as he is dealing with a, a situation with his body. Lord, we pray that you just keep your healing hand upon him. Lord, just ease, ease any of the pain he has. Lord, take, take the, the seizures away from him. Help him to be the young man that you have created him to be. Lord, touch him with a, a total healing. Lord, we know you know where the problem is. Lord, just touch that area and bring him back whole again. Lord, we pray for Pastor Raymond. And, and uh, Christina, Lord, just give them the peace of mind knowing that, Lord, you are in control, and, and this is all going to take place when you're ready to do that, when you're timing. Lord, we pray that you just comfort them, and let, 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 let them know that God is, is, is in, God is in control, Lord, and we just thank you for that. Lord, I also want to pray for Roberta. She goes through chemo treatment this week. Just pray that you would be with her and, and uh, hold her up and encourage her, Lord, and carry her through this week until the next week when she can rest again. We thank you, Lord, that you've been with her through all of this, um, these things that she's gone through and been with her through these times. 
Thank you. Continue to hold her up. 